going to do, the main topics of today will be, first of all, we'll study the anamorphism algebra of an abelian variety in general and then go to a finite field soon. So that's the first topic of today. And the second topic will be um, a stratification of the moduli space, which uh, Thorsten Ekedal and I studied, started studying state 20 years ago, and which should answer one of the questions one of the participants asked me. Can you explain something about the topology of a G? And of course, there is a big difference between characteristic zero, where you have a, a complex uniformization of the modular space that we don't have for the total modular space in characteristic P. And there are three different tools, which are foliations or stratifications, which explain parts of the modular space which give you feeling for which points are close, which points look alike, and so on and so on. And today I'll discuss one of these. And we are very much uh, directed to, to results because uh, the anamorphism algebra of the mean variety or a finite field will be one of the main tools in the last lecture by Ching Li, uh, where he has to connect uh, a bean varieties and a modular space, what he called the Siegel modular space, and then a much smaller modular space with Hilbert modular varieties. And that connection can only be made if you know the endomorphism algebras extremely well. So today it will be, the result will be really easy to understand. The proof is slightly more involved, and I will not give the whole proof. And so that will be the first method, the first tool which I'm uh, constructing for you today, and the second will be this uh, EO strata, the Ekedal O strata, which we'll construct and which will be a way of really feeling what is in this modular space. Now, I found out that uh, Henri Darmont has already proved the Tate conjecture for a being varieties over finite fields, and that was originally our plan to do. But as that has already been done, we much rather use our time <laughs> to prove results and theorems which, um, which are really directly used. So please allow me to go over two aspects, two beautiful aspects which deserve a lot of attention, but you have to choose something. So one is uh, theorem 317. which at that time when it was constructed, I really was, I was a young person then, even younger than I'm now, and I found it a beautiful theorem and I really loved it and I found it totally unexpected. Perhaps the, the specialist would, would uh, know more about it, but uh, I was totally flabbergasted at seeing that. So, you have an Levine variety over a field, and you take the endomorphism ring of the TL of the Tate L group, which I've introduced for you, it's the inverse limit of all the L power torsion points. And the map from the left hand side to the right hand side is not difficult to see, it's injective. And actually, you can do this as an exercise. So the exercise is to uh, well, take for granted that this is. Um, finitely generated as a Z module, easily show that it is uh, Z torsion free, and then prove that this is an injection. But of course, this has no chance to be equal to this one. But if you tensor this ZL, you still get a map. And the beautiful theorem is that if A is defined over K, and K is a finite type, over the prime field, P is, P is the prime field, so either correct is a P or, or, or a Q, then this is an isomorphism. Am I writing big enough for the last row? Please, uh, please warn me if not. 
Okay, well, this has been proved over a finite field by Tate. And then... Of course, of course. But also the Tate conjectures were completely new at that time. Yeah, okay, so you, so I completely agree, so even in 63, this, this, this was a big surprise for me. And uh, for over a finite field, everything is in, in the nodes. Over a finite field, this is proved by Tate. Then over arbitrary characteristic P fields, Zarhin and Mori have proved this. And Serre did a special case for elliptic curves over number fields. But then, uh, of course, Faltings in his big 1983 paper proved it over number fields, and then afterwards it was it readily followed also for for all characteristic zero fields of finite type over Q. Okay, so this will be one of the tools. Another tool which is not uh, used very much in this course but which I think everyone should really know is, and I'm not going to write down the full th theorem, is the Honda Tate theory. So if you want to have a nice exercise, please um, prove the my conjecture for a beam varieties over a finite field. So 310 is uh, the way conjecture over, over FQ. And there's an exercise which proves the way conjecture. So please remember that this, for a long, long period of time, has been one of the big puzzles in mathematics. In the 20s and the 30s, a lot of German mathematicians were working on this, and then Henry Wey took over, wrote his famous paper in, in 1940, developed all his foundations to really get his hands on the good foundations for, yeah, for doing this, and finally uh, proved the way conjectures for, the, for, for being varieties of finite fields. I think it was 47, and then only much, much later, uh, through the work of Groth and Deacon, finally the lean, the full way conjectures were proved in, was it 72 or something like that? So that's a big, big history, and you can be part of that history by just proving the way conjectures over a finite field as an exercise. So isn't that fantastic that you can? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you have to use two black boxes, but the black boxes are not two too difficult. So in retrospect, we say, well, this was a huge, huge, huge development. We had for a long period of time no idea where to start, what to do, and so on and so on. And then Anna Weyer really was the, the person to put his finger exactly on what should be done. <laughs> and then, and also this was a big surprise for me. <laughs> and then finally, this was proved. And I always thought this was an extremely hard theorem. Well, it is a deep theorem, but you can do it as an exercise. So, so that's as far as the uh, introduction for today. So now we roll up our sleeves and we start working. I'm going to use uh, the Tate conjecture. So now I'm going to use this in case, case, case of finite field. And I'm going to first discuss with you and the morphism algebras that would be right. OK, so here are some things which are completely in the notes, so you don't need to copy anything. I'm, I'm just copying from the notes, and I'm just telling you what should be done. OK, um, you have the endomorphisms of the beam variety. A will be in a beam variety over a field. And uh, I want you that the endomorphism of A in general is not the same as the endomorphism of A over a bigger field. I mean, the endomorphism ring may grow, and by this, this I really mean the endomorphism of A defined over the base field in the old terminology. 
And you can tensor that up. It is torsion free, Z torsion free, so you can tensor up with Q, and that's called the endomorphism algebra. So this is called the endomorphism ring, and this is the endomorphism algebra. And what I like to tell you first is that determining the endomorphism algebra of the beam variety is not very difficult. Once you know what you have to do, the number of possibilities is rather limited and you have a list of these and you can easily do it. But if you have this division, if you have this algebra, then you can ask the much finer question, which anamorphism rings do appear? And that's a problem which is still basically completely unsolved. So if you want a good problem, <laughs> fix yourself some, 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 some characteristics and some base field and so on and so on and so on and try to study which rings may appear as an amorphism ring of a beam variety. Okay, so I want to say that this is rather easy to understand and this is much more difficult. The thesis by Waterhouse, which is in, in, in the list of references, gives a, lots of, it gives a lot of information and you can really get from there lots of problems which are completely non-trivial and unsolved. Okay, now it's easy to see that if A is simple, I mean simple over the base field, then this endomorphism algebra is a division algebra. Of course, if it is simple, the image of, an, of a map either is zero or is everything. And if it is zero, the map is zero, if it is non-zero, the image is everything, and then you can invert the map up to uh, uh, dividing by some integer. So this is a division algebra. And such division algebras, I mean, they are finite over Q. And such a division algebra um, has a center. And we'll use the notation that the center we'll denote by L and then L is a finite extension of Q, and D is a central simple algebra over L. Now this D has more structure, namely any polarization induces an anti-involution. So let me first say it in words, and then you read the formula in, in, in the notes, right? You have a polarization on your abelian variety. And you choose one polarization, which need not to be an isomorphism, but it's just a polarization, right? And now on your abelian variety, if you have an endomorphism, you can take the dual of that endomorphism. But that's in a completely different ring. But now going back and forth by the, yeah, by the polarization, you transport it back to the endomorphism algebra. Now, of course, there's a little catch in there if the polarization is not an isomorphism, you can't expect to have the polarization inducing an anti-involution on and A. But if you invert integers, that's okay. So the Rosati involution is just the involution gotten by taking the dual abelian scheme and then endomorphism considering by duality. Okay, and now Albert, in the beginning of last century, um, made a complete classification of what I call a, an Albert algebra. So an Albert algebra is something which is finite dimension over Q, has an anti-involution, and moreover, this is positive definite in the sense that the trace of an element and the element Rosati, that that's a positive definite quadratic form on D. Now such algebras are called Albert algebras and they can be classified. And that classification gives you even more insight. Namely, that tells you <coughs> that this center does have a totally real subfield. And either these two are equal or they're not equal. So this degree is one or two. If this degree is one, 
then the center is a totally real f uh, field. Mind, mind A is simple all the time. And then Albert classified these in three different types. These are the commutative ones. These are the totally non-definite quaternion algebras. And these are the totally definite quaternion algebras. You might remember that last week we had lots of modular spaces. We had uh, Shimura curves and so on and so on. And there we had um, all kinds of division algebras <coughs> where sometimes you choose one prime at infinity to be split, to be, to be non-ramified, and other primes uh, ramified. You remember this talk by Jan Vorst where, where there were two primes at infinity and one was, uh, was ram one was not ramified and then the other two were ramified. Such an algebra is not a division algebra of of the oven being variety because these are the totally indefinite ones so all the infinite primes are indefinite are split and these are totally definite so please be careful that uh, the division algebras quaternion algebras used last time are not automatically all division algebras of, 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 of curves okay so this is general theory and if the L0 is not L then L is a CM field. So what is the CM field? It's in the notes. A CM field is a quadratic extension of a totally real field. Totally real means that under every embedding into the complex numbers, you land into the reals. Then you do this, and then you want this extension to be, to be totally imaginary. That is, that extension, if you land, if you map it to C, it never lands for no of these in the, in the real numbers. And that can be rephrased in the say, saying that this is totally real and that any, any embedding of L into L0, complex conjugation restricts to L to, yeah, to the image and maps L to itself and is the involution, the Begelda map of L over L0. So these are CM fields and they're well known. Okay? Now, in the notes, there is a structural theorem for uh, the endomorphism algebra of a, yeah, of a simple field. And I think, well, you are so, I mean, I've talked to many of you and I'm impressed by the quality of people here. So I think that most people here can do this exercise. I mean, the real difficult theorem is this theorem. Right? But once you have this theorem, and once you know a little bit about Honda theory, then the structure theorem, which is given by Tate, is not very difficult. And I'm not spending too much time on this. I only want to say the following. So as a corollary of this, of this structure theorem, I will discuss with you what is the anamorphism algebra of a simple a beam variety over the algebraic closure of F. Ching Li, do you need also the a beam varieties of a finite fields of only over F P bar? Over F P bar. Okay, so so this is the essential thing. I take any a beam variety which is defined over the algebraic closure of a finite field. Then the claim is that two possibilities, either it is a super singular elliptic curve or it is not. You will agree with that. If it is a super singular elliptic curve, its endomorphism algebra is the algebra which was denoted in 1940 by Doring as KP infinity. It is the unique quaternion algebra which is exactly ramified at P at infinity. And you can write down generators and equations and so on and so on. I mean, there, there, there's no trouble. Okay, so this case appears. And this is exactly the case of 3, 1. If the V variety is not a super singular elliptic curve, then all the other cases are out except the case 4. So if in this case, so it's not a super singular E, then the endomorphism algebra, and A is over over a 
finite field, right? Then this one contains its center, and this is the MF field, and this degree is 2E0, and this degree is D squared. And now as a corollary of the whole, of, well, of everything, say the corollary of, of 317 or the corollary of 107 says that E0 times D is G, which by definition is the dimension of your Lean variety. Okay, now I want to warn you, there, there is a, the, I explained the notion of sufficiently many complex multiplications. And I'm always careful in writing this instead of CM. Um, there is a big difference between sufficiently many complex multiplications, CM type, or being varieties with CM. <laughs> and there's a huge confusion. So if it being variety adds more, admits more endomorphisms than just Z, some people say it has CM, some people say, don't say it has CM. <laughs> if it has CM, and sufficiently many CM, the CM field or an order in it acts on the tangent space. And if moreover this action is given, that's called the CM type. And sufficiently many complex multiplications, it's in the notes, is that it contains, the, the endomorphism algebra contains the semi symbol commutative sub algebra of rank 2G. Okay, so here you see that uh, any abelian variety over a finite field admits sufficiently many complex multiplications, but be careful. Um, for example, in this case, if the D is positive, right, you can have that this endomorphism algebra contains L, then it can contain L prime, well, L prime is a CM field again. And now of degree 2G, right? So on A, you have this L prime acting, but you also have D acting. And, and they may be different. So let me first draw a conclusion from this. And that's the conclusion uh, Ching Li will need in his last lecture. So if you have an abelian variety over a finite field and you take the endomorphism algebra over uh, the algebraic closure, the claim is there exists the product of totally real fields such that this product embeds in some way in the endomorphism algebra and that uh, the dimension of this totally real field is exactly G. So how does the proof go? Well, here I have a CM field of degree 2G. This contains a totally real subfield, which is one of these Fs, right? And now you use Poincaré by to, if you have any abelian variety up to isogeny, it's a product of simple ones, and then you use these, these things. Now, why are we so choosy about this? So let me run ahead, and you will see back this, this, this whole method uh, in Friday this week. One of the beautiful tricks which Jing Li found was what is called now the Hilbert trick. Um, you take a point and modelized space, and this will be eventually in, in, in the closure of some hacker orbit, and you want to know what in the neighborhood is happening. Now this point you can choose over a finite field. So this point has sufficiently many complex multiplications, hence this point, this is being right, receives in its endomorphism algebra a product of totally real fields. And now for these totally real fields, you can develop a whole series of, 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 of theory, which will be done in section in, in lecture six, which are Hilbert modular varieties. But I want to point to one essential difficulty in the whole theory. You see, some Hilbert modular varieties are extremely easy to understand. For example, if this E is just one field, and if P is totally inert in that field, 
power of P is totally ramified in that field, well, you'd say everything is easy and you really have quite good access to everything. But remember how we got this, uh, this, this E. This E we got by just choosing randomly one point over a finite field in this closure of this Hecke orbit. Now this point has no ID. We don't know anything about this. It's, it's, it's Newton polygon, about this endomorphism ring, about anything. So we have no idea what P does in this um, CM field, whether it splits, whether it's inert, whether it's ramified, or whether it has different behaviors above other primes, and so on and so on. But so we are forced to use the most general situation where we just have any E, but where we have no information about behavior of P in this field E. So that will be one of the big difficulties, and that will be solved. Cheng Li will show you how to, yeah, how to solve that. Okay, so to run ahead of everything, um, at the last lecture, the Hecke orbit will be closed, and then you choose a point, and we need information of the Hecke orbit around that point. And then the beautiful trick is to map the Hilbert model of variety, well, up to our correspondence, into this modelized space, and first do it for the Hilbert modular variety. Now this Hilbert modular variety is associated to this E, and we have no idea what E it is. But still, you can do everything, and Ching Li will show you how in that case, density of the Hecke orbit is clear, is proven, can be proved for yeah, Hilbert modular varieties, then you know that in ev every point on this Zariski closure of the Hecke orbit, you have Hilbert modular varieties passing through all these points. And for all these points, you have density. Well, and then you, you really conclude density in the equal space. Okay, so that is, that is that future. And we certainly, I'm not going to do that now. And I've explained for you how, how we, are going to use this. So I hope you agree. I will not explain you Tate's beautiful proof and, uh, and all the surprises in there. I hope you spend time on proving the way conjectures for, for being right over finite fields. And then uh, you have digested most of this. And you can read the notes which Albert algebras do appear. And I want to make two remarks, but I'm not going to write them down during the notes. One remark is, if you have a, an abelian variety which admits sufficiently many complex multiplications, or CM type, or CM abelian varieties, like some people say, and so on and so on, it's an easy exercise um, that this abelian variety if it is in characteristic zero, is defined over a number field. I think Shimura was the first to observe this, and uh, met with the technique available we now have, it's not so. It's not so very difficult. Question: If I have an abelian variety in characteristic p, which has sufficiently many complex multiplications, is it defined over a finite field? And the answer is no. But Grothendieck proved a partial converse to, uh, to Tate's theorem. The Tate's theorem says that if you have an abelian variety over a finite field, it is a CM type. It admits sufficiently many complex multiplications. And Grothendieck proved the opposite. If you have sufficiently many complex multiplications, then it's isogenous to an abelian variety, which is defined over a finite field. And it's a beautiful theorem, and, and, and the proof is really magnificent. Let me tell you a little story. I perhaps have one minute for that. Long, long ago, I saw this sentence in Mumford's book on the beam varieties, and I was in Warwick. There was a year in algebraic geometry, and so <coughs> I asked uh, the lean. Uh, well, there's no proof in Mumford's book, but Mumford says that Grothendieck proved that beam variety with CM over a characteristic P field is exogenous to a beam variety over a finite field. So please, can you explain me? And the lean started one line of explanation, and at that moment, David Mumford came in, 
and said, what are you proving? And the lean said two words, and David said three words. And then they disagreed for, say, 20 seconds. And then they fully agreed, and one walked out one door, and one the other one walked out the other door. And I had no idea <laughs> about the proof. <laughs> <laughs> so there I was. OK, there is a method of knowing what they said. Namely, I wrote to the lean, uh, very uh, uh, well, polite letter. Can you please explain me? what you were trying to say at that moment. And by return mail, I received one and a half page torn out of a pad with just a few lines written on it. And it took me one and a half months to understand. <laughs> but then I understood the proof, and it's really beautiful. OK, sorry for this uh, uh, talking about old times. <coughs> now I'm going halfway my lecture to go to Yes, I published it in the Journal of Pure and Applied Algebra. It's in the notes. And the history was that I then wrote to Grotendieck and said, listen, uh, everybody's interested. Am I allowed to, to publish your proof? And, and he said, yes, yes, go ahead. But the paper makes very clear that, that nothing is my idea. I mean, <laughs> it's just my understanding of, of the Lean's uh, uh, explanation of yeah, all three of, 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 of Gordon Lee proof. It's called the Sargini class of an immune variety of a CM immune variety is defined over a finite field. Ah, I should tell you something. There is a terrible misprint in the notes. If M is a number, which is at least 55, and you see a citation M, then please read M plus 1. <laughs> I'm sorry for the. It's my fault, I think. Well, anywhere, if you see any, <laughs> if you see any reference, so let's go to whatever place you want. I'm in section 3 now, so. Yes, it's for reference. For example, in the middle of yeah, yeah, in the middle of page twenty-three, there, there, there are three references to thirty, to ninety-three, ninety-four, and fifty-nine. You all have to look for the next paper <laughs> in the list. Probably you, you found out already, or, or, you, or you thought the notes were getting crazy. Okay, now today I want to finish my story into a new topic, and I want to spend some time on that. And let me first explain you the ID. What is a big, big ID in algebraic geometry? You want to understand a certain situation. What do you do? You take the geometric situation, you let it depend on the parameters, and then you degenerate. And then in the degenerate case, you are in a much easier situation, you hope, and there you do your computations. And then you just try to, to use this information for, yeah, yeah, for the general information. OK, this technique has been extremely useful uh, in all kinds of mathematics. And I don't need to tell such an exquisite audience of all the applications, because you know many applications, I hope. And today, I will explain you a method of degeneration for beam varieties. But by degeneration, I do not mean going to the boundary in the sense that the beam variety degenerates, but I mean that the p-structure becomes more special. So in the back of your mind, if you want to have an example, if you want to prove that um, AG, um, that uh, the modular space would principal rise of being variety is irreducible, geometrically irreducible. That's stated in section 10. How do you prove it? Well, in crisis zero, you just know that Siegel space, Siegel upper half space, <laughs> is connected. You have analytic parameterization, so the modular space, complex points, is connected. And basically, it's non-singular. If you go to a level structure, it is non-singular. So, and, and of course, a non-singular connected 
algebraic variety is irreducible. Okay, so that's the end of the proven characteristic zero. Now we don't have such techniques in characteristic P. And irreducibility of AG1 was proved by Cheng Li in his PhD thesis, was proved by Faltings in his beautiful talk at the Arbeitstagung, and that was about the same time. But that uses characteristic zero. And much later, we have now a proof with which is pure characteristic P. So what's the proof? I'll sketch you in a few words. You first degenerate the P structure. So that finally you come to a stratum which consists of a finite number of points. So you prove that any neutral polygon stratum contains in its boundary one of these uh, finitely many points. Then you construct a one-dimensional stratum which connects all these points and you prove that that's connected. And then you're done. So these degeneration techniques uh, give you a lot of insight. Okay, now let me explain you what the, be careful, what the uh, technique is. I associate to the bean variety its p-divisible group, and then to the p-divisible group, I can associate three, as three different things. Namely, I can associate to this x, x up to isogeny of an algebraically closed field, or I can associate to this something up to isomorphism of an algebraically closed field, or I can only look at the p kernel, which of course is also the same the p kernel of A, and this up to isomorphism. So what you do, you go to model space, you fix one of the variety, and you choose one of these three objects, that you keep in mind, then you locate all other abelian varieties, which have the same invariant, and that you postulate as being one stratum, right? And then another isomorphism type classifies a, a different stratum, and so on and so on and so on. Now, uh, this will be the theory of Newton polygon strata, and this is in the back of our mind all the time we, we give the discussion. This is the theory of foliations, and Ching Li and I have decided not to do anything about foliation because that would really involve a lot of technique, new technique, and this, so this will be not studied. And this is uh, the work by Ekedal and myself. And this I will discuss now. Now, let me, before doing this, make, uh, make a confession. Um, I hope you are all algebraic geometers and you're all good algebraic geometers. And if you want to construct a space, how do you do it? Well, you follow our big hero. You make a functor and you prove that the functor is representable. And then once you have done it, you immediately know the tangent space at every point and so on and so on from the functor, right? So that is an honest algebraic geometer doing. Now, what I said before is completely messing up this picture because what I said, I take one isomorphism type, right? And then I take all fibers which have the same invariant. And then I, I declare this as a stratum, <laughs> but this, is not a priori defined by, the, yeah, by a functor. And actually, here, I have no functorial approach. And Kei Zheng Li and I worked for, for years on defining a good functor uh, which would a priori describe the supersingular locus. And we failed. I mean, in our lecture notes, you, you, you find the whole section on that, but it's, it's not clean. And here, I also completely failed. But here, uh, von der Geer and Ekedal have introduced a theory which describes the EO strata in a much better way. And there, you really see what the scheme structure is. So let me go back. I take one invariant, either one of these three. I take the locus of a variety as having this invariant. 
So either the Nutu Polygon up to isomorphism or the p divisible group up to, up to isogeny or the p divisible group up to isogeny up, up to isomorphism or the p kernel up to isomorphism, right? Then what we do is suppose we work over a perfect field. Then you take this locus and you prove it's locally closed uh, and you put the induced scheme structure over your perfect field. Now that's a very nasty way of doing, and that's not a good way of doing algebraic geometry, but I confess I don't know a better way. Yeah? Okay, so now I'm going with you after this confession. I still want to show you that this is, that this is useful. So now I go with you to 322. No need to write out anything, but I'll warn you because soon there will be a proof and and, and, and two examples, and those are not in the, in, in, in the notes. Okay, so what we do, we take a Levine variety, it has a polarization, and to this Levine variety, I associate the P kernel. So that's the P kernel and the form induced um, on that uh, finite group scheme. Now, I will discuss only the case that lambda is a principal polarization, but the EO strata are you, they really can do for everything. Now this you can classify up to isomorphism of an algebraically closed field. And remember that I told you yesterday that if you take a beam variety and you take the p square kernel, you have an infinite amount of isomorphism classes. But if you take the p kernel, Hans-Peter Kraft, yeah, let's see it. I, yeah, I told you yesterday. Hans-Peter Kraft and I independently, well, Hans-Peter Kraft proved it and I in, much later independently observed it, that the number of group schemes annihilated by p of an algebraically closed field of fixed rank is finite in number. And then you also prove that this is finite in number. And that's a little bit tricky. For P non two, it's easy. But for P two, it's, it's, well, it's quite a lot of work. <laughs> but don't mind about that. Okay, now this object, I'll, I'll call phi. So when you see a phi, that really means an isomorphism class of such a finite group scheme with there is a polarization. I'll tell you the little difficulty. If P is two, you know that a um, polarization is symmetric, that the form on the P divisible group is anti-symmetric, and then you restrict it to the P kernel, and you want to distinguish this from other maps, from other bilinear pairings, right? But for P2, symmetric and anti-symmetric <laughs> coincide. So all of a sudden, the tool of being symmetric or anti-symmetric is completely out of your hands. And well, you may read the paper to see how it's solved in characteristic two. But in characteristic non two, this is, this is basically what it is. Okay, so now I define S phi is the set of all A lambda moduli points such that A lambda uh, square brackets P equals phi, or isomorphic to phi of an algebraic closed field, right? And this is called an EO stratum, Ekerdal Oert stratum. And this sits in moduli space. And why are these things useful? Now let me first mention you a beautiful result by Renault. Namely, you take a moduli space in characteristic P. I don't write the tensor FP anymore, right? And let T be an irreducible component. 
and study the ordinary locus. So if you don't want degrees and, <laughs> and everything, you just take the principally polarized beam varieties and take the ordinary locus in there. So that's the locus where uh, we're working on. And the beautiful result by Renault is that this is quasi affine. Quasi affine means uh, an affine minus a closed set. So, for example, affine plane minus one point. You all know the exercise in Hartshorn that this is not an affine <laughs> scheme, but this is quasi affine. Okay, now Renault proved that this is quasi affine. And the proof was published by Spiro in a special case, and by Moret Bailly in his, uh, in his thesis later in full generality. Now let me explain you the proof, because this really gives you a lot of insight in how to do geometry on the almost modular space. But before I give the proof, let me mention you that what does it mean that this is crazy affine? Well, for example, does there exist a component of moduli space which is totally filled up by ordinary uh, points? The answer is no, because you know that the boundary of this is very low dimensional, <laughs> right? So a component has high dimension, half g times g minus g plus one. The boundary is co-dimension g, so this component certainly is not f fine or crazy f fine or anything like that. If you have an affine variety and you close it up, then, 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 then the boundary really has, uh, yeah, that has co-dimension one. So this is not everything. So that means that in the boundary of the ordinary, you have more points. And that's a way to go down in, in modular space. Now, let me briefly tell you how, yeah, how you get this proof. Let A be the B in variety over T. You remember that I warned you that A and script A are different. This is the B in scheme and this is the modular space, right? And I can take P infinity here. And as Cheng Di explained to you yesterday, you have a local part and you have an etal part. So this is geometrically mu P infinity to the power of G, and this geometrically is QP mod ZP to, yeah, to the power of G. Claim there exists a finite map such that if you take x1 t prime, that this really is, uh, sorry, now, now I want to take, uh, yeah, I want to take uh, the kernel here, that this is isomorphic to mu p to the power g, yeah? And that's, and that's clear. I mean, if you take the Frobenius kernel, you get in every fiber mu p, mu p to the power of g has a finite automorphism group, right? So you just unravel this by, yeah, but it's something like this. So what does it mean that if you take the tension bundle of A prime over T prime, that this is trivial because this really gives me a frame for uh, the tension space over the whole modular space. So that means that this is a trivial bundle, right? Now, if you dualize, it stays trivial. If you take the determinant, this, it is a trivial line bundle. But this, uh, yeah. So, sorry, this, this is over the ordinary locus. Okay, so this is omega, but we all know in characteristic zero that this is ample. And actually the thesis of Marabayi is, is one of the main theorems is that this is ample in characteristic P. Aha, uh -huh. so what do we see? We have omega, and that is restricted to T prime, which on the one hand is ample, and on the second hand is trivial. But that can only be possible if this, if this space is crazy f one, right? Okay, now let me give you the second example. 
Suppose I study a beam varieties of dimension two. I just take an easy example. And where the P rank is exactly one. Yeah? And let T be the space where this happens. So this is the space, subset of moduli space where the, where the B varieties have dimension two, a B in surfaces, and where the P rank is exactly one. And I'm going to prove you that this is quasi F1. Now there's a, there, there, there's a trouble in it, because I have my A restricted to T, and I take AP, and of course what I want to do is I want to make a frame for uh, the tension space. But this one has a filtration, so let's call this N. So let me follow my notes. Otherwise, I yeah, so I have N1, N2, N3 in N, where this geometrically is the S mu P. So this now is a group scheme over T, and every fiber here is mu P. So N1, open algebraically closed field, is mu P. Aha, we have our Raynaud trick back again. After finite cover, we can trivialize this group scheme. And this one is not very interesting. This, uh, this is uh, Ching Li writes it one over P. Like this, that's okay. But this one is isomorphic geometrically to uh, the P kernel of a super singular elliptic curve. Now, what is the F kernel of this? That's alpha P. And this poor alpha P has no canonical coordinate, has an infinite automorphism group. You cannot unravel this, it seems, after a finite extension, so we completely lost. Now in 1985, um, Thorsten Ekedal showed me how to, how to do this, and this is really fantastic, because this N1, right, it sits over N1F, and then it sits over zero. So this geometrically is alpha P, and this geometrically is alpha P, right? But now let me write down what, what we know about this. I take, I'll continue here, I take N1 over N1, uh, N2, thank you. Sometimes I say that on purpose I make a mistake to see that everybody's still paying attention, but this was just a slip. <laughs> Excuse me? N3 minus N2, it's, it's constant up to a Galois twist. So what is your question? Sorry. I'm wondering whether N2 factored by N1. N2 by N1, yeah. That is uh, isomorphic to. N, N is my P kernel. What he's asking is, when you write, you have an extension of alpha P by alpha P, that's N2 mod N1. N, N2, he's saying. Ah, okay, sure, sure, uh, sorry, thank you. You're right, <laughs> okay. Now you're, now you're happy? It is part of the kernel of, uh, yeah, 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 I'll forget it, okay? Now this one, so, so let me call this N, and let me call this N prime. After all, the, the, these are finite flat group schemes over, uh, over my space. Okay, so this was called N, and this I can map by Frobenius, to n prime 
twist. And this is an isomorphism. So you have this, this, these two layers of alpha p, and by Frobenius, the lower one is killed, and Frobenius maps the upper, pop, the, the upper step isomorphically on, 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 onto this. And the same thing we have, uh, how do I write that? If I take n, I have Verschiebung, which is uh, mapped isomorphically add to this, right? Now, what does this mean? This means that if I take the tangent space of, uh, of n, of course, along t, right? The tangent bundle. That this is isomorphic to the same thing, p squared. Because you can, you can invert this isomorphism, right? Then write one more p here, get this one n p, and then get this one n prime p. Okay, so this is all of a sudden this line bundle now is torsion. <coughs> so this line bundle now has uh, p squared minus one torsion. What does it prove? That proves that if you take the tangent space of uh, of n one restricted to t uh, times the tangent space of n of t after a base change which is finite. This is. Uh, this is trivial. And now the same trick of Renault applies. Okay. So, conclusion, uh, for every phi, S phi is quasi F phi. Yeah? Okay. Now, from this, we can deduce the following corollary, and perhaps you can do it as an application, as an exercise. 3, 2, 3, you take any point in moduli space, and actually I, I, would, I would like to have the print polarized. That is a misprint, the, the, the one should be low. And I take the hacker L over a bit, and I take this risky closure, and this is a risky closure inside AG1. And the claim is that this contains a super singular point. Now, I didn't define you yet what super singular means. So, at a beam variety, overfield K is super singular, even only if there exists an isomorphism. with uh, E super singular elliptic curve. And it's a fact that um, A is super singular if and only if the Newton polygon of A is, uh, is a straight line with slopes of half. Now please note that this is a very strange theorem. If you have, yeah. Uh, sorry, sure, sure, as Archimedes. Oh, thank you very much for saving a big, <laughs> a big mistake. <laughs> okay, now let me say one comment on this. If you take an abelian variety and you take its p divisible group, and the p divisible group splits up after isogeny to a product. Is there any chance that the beam variety splits up as a product? Now anybody doing Lie groups in characteristic zero knows that this is nonsense. I mean, the Lie group of, of, of uh, has a tension space. It certainly splits up in many, many ways. 
but such a splitting will never or almost never give you a splitting of the, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, of the Lie group itself. Now the same is true for, for a beam variety. If you take any beam variety, then in general the p-divisible group splits up in a lot of uh, parts, at least two and, and probably more, uh, unless the beam variety is, uh, is in the curve. Does that splitting induce you any splitting of the p-divisible group? Now there's a strange fact. If the beam variety is super singular, yes it does for every super singular. And, convert, and, and, and otherwise, for every Newton polygon which is not super singular, there does exist a simple abelian variety <laughs> having that Newton polygon. So the splitting is automatic for super singular and in general not true for non-super singular. Okay, now I'm not going to prove this fact, but I think you can do this as you really can do this as an exercise if you take the, the things which are stated in the, in the notes. So let me very briefly tell you what you do. You first take a lemma, which is in section one, that Ching Li proved that this orbit is finite even if, even only if X is super singular. You have to use that. Okay, so take this orbit. If X is super singular, I'm done. And we don't go any further. If X is not super singular, this is not finite, so this is positive dimensional. Now, you know that Hecker L doesn't do anything with the, with the P divisible group. So, such a Hecker L orbit automatically is contained in anything you like, in the Newton polygon stratum, in, in leaf of the foliation, in uh, stratum of the Ecuador Earth stratification, whatever you like. But in any case, it is contained in an EO stratum. Now, suppose you have chosen your point X in such a way that your uh, EO type is minimal on that neutral polygon stratum. You only have finitely many. You order them by uh, something is smaller if it is contained in the boundary of, yeah, of the next one. And you take, you already assume that this X is minimal. Then, this or it goes to the, to the true boundary, degeneration. But now you have to study the moduli space at the boundary of the alpha toroidal compactification and see if there the EO stratum changes, then it also changes uh, in the interior. So that's a little study on this situation at the boundary, and it's not very difficult. Okay, so now we see a technique of going down in, in the whole thing. If you take this stratum, just, just a set of points, if you take this risky closure, how are you ever going to study it? Well, the degeneration, we degenerate to the two super singular curves, uh, being right. And that will be used in the last lecture. Okay, uh, this, will, this is the end of lecture three. Uh, tomorrow I will go to much more specialistic things. Tomorrow and on Thursday I will prove you two theorems which uh, use a lot of Technique, but the theorems are really clear and clean cut. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>